everyone. This is Molly Brenner. I'm the Network Coordinator at Kinetic Alliance. We're going to go ahead and start with our webinar. Um, today, the webinar is titled Educating Members of Congress. Um, this is part of our Genetic Stay on the Hill web series, which is June 23rd at the Reserve Officers Association at Capitol Hill. Um, if you've not registered already, we encourage you to do so. Um, the, our speaker today is Karen Hendricks, who is the current um, Director of Policy Development for Trust for America's Health. She's done this webinar several times before for us and is an expert on the topic. Um, Trust for America's Health, 17 years. She was the Assistant Director um, in the Department of Federal Affairs for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, just before I turn it over to her, I want to remind um, you all of a few things. Um, you are on mute during the call, so if you have any questions or comments, either technical or those related to the discussion at hand, you can submit them via the question function on the webinar panel at any time during the call. Um, we will dedicate the last 10 minutes or so um, for questions and answers, and I definitely encourage you to submit your questions. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available for streaming or downloading next week. Um, the, it will be on our website next Monday, as well as the three specific issue webinars that we have pre-recorded um, for the issues we are going to be addressing on Genetic Sam Health. So, um, before I start, also please remember to fill out the automated survey after you exit the webinar software. We would greatly appreciate it. Now, Karen, go ahead and take it over. Okie dokie. Okay. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to join all of you um, again this year, especially as Genetic Alliance celebrates its 25th anniversary. And this is the uh, sixth year, I believe, that you've gone up um, uh, uh, to the hill. And if I'm still doing this at the 25th anniversary of you're going to the Hill, we really do have a problem with our advocates. Um, I'd like to start first with, you know, first coming to D.C. And presumably all of you have made this um, journey before. And um, most of you have come from what is would be considered the real world. And now you're entering... Um, what is quite surreal on uh, on many fronts. Um, to put this into context, uh, I'd like to first start, this is a quick overview, with uh, beginning with the administration talking a little bit about uh, what's on their agenda and looking at literally what the 112th Congress, this first session, looks like. Um, slip in one of the key implementation issues that we're all uh, very, very much uh, interested in a part of with respect to health care reform, and then get down to the, the nitty-gritty of um, educating your member of Congress. The administration, as we all know, has a um, full, full plate. Their agenda includes, um, quite obviously and potentially in many of your communities, an unemployment rate that is over 9% um, across the United States, and we do know that in certain communities, minority group com communities, in rural communities, um, that percentage is, is far higher. Um, we are uh, at the tail end of a uh, recession, although some have called it a, a depression. We're uh, in the midst of uh, how to raise the, the debt ceiling. Uh, poverty is unfortunately increasing. The issues around Im Im um, immigration remain very high. So President Obama and his cabinet officers have uh, a lot to do. Uh, in addition to which, we have uh, what I am calling the real-life uh, disasters of, uh, that are truly interfering with how uh, dollars can be expended and are absolutely those things that are out of our control. Tornadoes, 
we're at the beginning of a hurricane season, which will last well into uh, the beginning of, of winter. Fires in uh, Arizona and New Mexico are just beginning. Um, there are floods, there are droughts. So we have all of these other things that are, are going around um, that we truly don't have any control of, yet the administration has a very important role to play in how to address um, all of these uh, disasters. The 112th Congress, which began uh, in January of this year, saw uh, much the same as we ended the last 111th Congress. Um, between the Republicans and, and the Democrats, not much is um, happening in the way of moving issues um, forward. We now have uh, a new configuration of the House and Senate. There are um, new freshman members of the uh, House. There were 94 new House members. Uh, many of them aspire to being uh, called part of the, the Tea Party caucus. As you can see from the makeup of the 112th Congress, uh, the gap between the Republicans and the Democrats in the Senate has uh, significantly decreased, and clearly there is now a new House uh, majority. The leadership of uh, this 112th Congress has not changed on, uh, on the Senate side, but there is clearly the big flip there with a new Speaker of the House, John Boehner from um, Ohio. How this Congress looks, it looks uh, in terms of demographics um, fairly similar to the last uh, several Congresses. There are um, a few more women in both the, the House and the Senate. Otherwise, um, it's is looking pretty much the same as the 111th Congress. Um, in looking at a level out of the 435 members of the House and the 100 members of the Senate, we see that we have, you know, basically a couple of handful of health professionals, although um, I'm not aware that any of these members who range from physicians to nurses, uh, surgeons and dentists uh, and the like, that there are any that have uh, a background related to genetics in, in any shape or form. I will note that um, 17 years ago, which was uh, at the uh, midpoint, almost end of health care reform under the Clinton administration, there were at that time five or six health professionals in Congress, and you can see how that has um, quadrupled over these last years. The key committees that uh, are important in relationship to um, health and health-related issues, as you can see on the Senate side, um, include the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, uh, Senator Harkin from Iowa, who's always been a great supporter of uh, health-related issues that has been um, one of his uh, cornerstones, uh, and Senator Enzi from from Wyoming as the ranking minority, the Finance and the Appropriations Committee, and the Appropriations Committee becomes very important as, uh, in, with respect to some of the issues that you'll be taking um, to the Hill. Similarly, on the House side, um, again, most notably, there's a switch in leadership uh, in, in the key committees from uh, Democrats to um, Republicans, and you can see sort of the broad array of um, representation um, on the House side in terms of these key committees um, as well, although Michigan seems to have an awful lot of uh, members who are in uh, leadership uh, places. The, 
the efforts that we've all tried to make um, in urging uh, collaboration and cooperation um, across the aisles on, uh, with respect to Congress, in these last several years, it's really fell on some deaf ears. And in particular, as we look at almost the inclusion of the six months, we can see that um, Congress hasn't really been doing a lot this year that they've been able to then send after their House and Senate completes the bill uh, and it goes to the President. We have a total of 17 bills that have been signed into law, most notably the FY 2011 um, spending bill, um, but all else, not so much. And uh, this will um, become really important as the year pro progresses and what needs to be done and what needs to be accomplished. And the degree of cooperation and collaboration must improve if we are um, to move forward on some very critical issues um, related to health uh, in this particular Congress. An issue of great importance to um, all of us in the health care community, in the public health community, um, in the research world, is the implementation of health care reform, the Affordable Care Act. And what most of us here inside um, the Beltway have been spending uh, most of our time on is trying to maintain, protect, and prevent the dismantling of the Affordable um, Care Act. Uh, the administration, the executive branch, um, is moving um, quickly forward on what is in, important to uh, be accomplished in their, uh, their timeline and strategy. In fact, tomorrow is the release of the National Prevention Strategy um, that the measurements of the Affordable Care Act will uh, be, be placed again. And, and at this point, all systems are go, but we do know that every opportunity is being used to try and dismantle the Affordable Care Act. So when all of you are, are on the, the Hill next week, uh, you should be alerted to whatever issue you're going up uh, on the Hill on the issues. Uh, it, inevitably, the questions will morph into, depending on the office that you're in, on health care reform. Um, I'd like to show this slide so you have a sense of what I call some points of entry as advocates. You know, first when a bill is introduced, then as it moves toward um, committee where there are places of, uh, and opportunities as advocates um, to go to the Hill to um, feature members of Congress at home. Um, during their district work periods and, and recess, but there are all sorts of places that are um, important to, to think about and different strategies that you um, potentially can, can use. When we consider advocacy and the role all of you will, will play next week, uh, it is uh, a, a relatively um, simple process. You are trying to influence certain outcomes as the legislative process uh, moves forward, as well as um, be able to speak up, speak about, and ensure that the issues that you care about are front and center. And yes, this is called the dreaded world word of lobbying, but as you'll know, it is um, as simple as um, going to your uh, state representatives, going to your federal representatives, or, or in some instances, uh, the President of the United States to state your case. So if you need a, uh, a street light on a congested corner, there are things that you know you should do. 
to ensure that that happens. Um, and it, I, I can't stress how much um, it is needed and necessary that we have uh, a citizen engagement in advocacy. There are, there are what we call um, sort of the basics, if you think of nothing else, that it's important to know your subject, um, know that member of the House and Senate who you're going to uh, have a meeting with and, and visit, what's the district like, um, are there any issues that are, uh, are important to your district that ha may have nothing to do with health, nothing to do with um, the role of and the issues of importance to the Genetic um, Alliance, but very much shape what that member of, of Congress is thinking, so knowing the political um, situation. Uh, knowing how to listen, what is said and what, what is not said um, is extremely important. There are countless meetings that um, in my career I have been in where what I thought I heard and what the other person in the room with me, and that's why it's often really good to have a couple of colleagues with you when you go on these visits, uh, it is completely different. And you, you know, we want to hear something so we think we heard it when in fact that's not the, the case. Try to anticipate um, where there may be some uh, concerns raised by the congressional office. Um, know how to compromise. And, and at the meetings you're going to, that's probably not as big an issue right now as it will be as the political process continues to un unfold, especially with respect to budget and appropriations and funding of programs that you, you care about. Uh, know how to build a coalition and be part of a coalition. I think that is um, clearly borne out in the Ge Genetic Alliance that only knew how to build a coalition but knew how to lead a coalition uh, when the Genetic Discrimination Act was passed um, two years ago. Uh, how to use the media. We could do a whole session on the role of the, the uh, media in advocacy, but it's it's safe to say that there are those opportunities um, that it may be very important to pull that trigger to ensure that the media is very much aware of the legislative concerns that you may have. And above all, you want to try and, and um, keep your sense of humor and enjoy the process. And there's going to be all too many times when neither one will uh, be the case, but I strongly encourage you to try and do that. Policymakers, <coughs> excuse me, want to hear from um, all of you. You know, first uh, of all, you are a constituent, and the response that you will get and the response I will get will be completely different in many instances, <coughs> both from your role as community leader, um, a stakeholder, and clearly the most obvious, a voter, um, as well as, as taxpayer. You have expertise. Uh, you have personal experience. You are an expert on, um, on genetic issues. What policymakers then want to hear from you <laughs> are the facts, being able to provide um, reliable information having a, um, a set of, of talking points for yourself, but a fact sheet that you can uh, leave behind. One of the key issues is to be able to, in a very short period of time, um, present your story, tell your experience, give a sense of you know, what are the best solutions to uh, the particular legislative issue that you're there for, what is your position uh, on a particular issue? Again, um, personalizing that message and ideally what you want to, to, to leave behind is an informed staff, an informed member of Congress. 
and persuade them that your way and your recommendation truly is um, important and is uh, the best. There are a variety of advocacy tools. The one that um, all of you are going to use uh, next week is the um, face to face meeting. Um, but there's going to be some follow up that's going to be important as the weeks and months uh, proceed leading up to the end of this session um, of phone calls, of letters, of uh, other visits at home in uh, the state that you are coming from, uh, emails are uh, an interesting configuration in terms of building that relationship. And I encourage emails um, once you really know that congressional staff person. Uh, otherwise, your emails oftentimes end up in a dark hole, and that's something that you want to avoid um, at all costs. Being able to present testimony, as testimony is um, uh, opportunities to present themselves, working on advisory groups, uh, both for legislation that has been enacted or in other venues like the Institute of Medicine, I just noticed uh, not too long ago uh, that Sharon Cherry is on an, an IOM uh, uh, policy panel, and that's going to be very important for her to bring forward the issues um, that she cares about through the Genetic Alliance, um, and then looking at opportunities as those reports from the IOM uh, come into the public domain. Congress does look at those. Congress has always been paying for those. So your participation in advisory groups um, are another way to influence and have um, an advocacy role. Uh, that nicely segues into the other advocacy um, uh, awareness, another tool, and that is primarily through um, utilizing the, the press, uh, having um, press briefings, and press conferences, opinion letters, and as we'll, we'll know, um, the role of the of social media. In looking at the issues that you're going to uh, bring forward, and your you know three key uh, legislative issues for uh, 2011 and for the Genetic um, Alliance, these are extremely critical issues, and this is a excellent time uh, as negotiations are um, beginning on uh, things like the Title V um, block grant program that comes out of the Maternal and Child Health uh, Bureau in HRSA. Um, the NIH and all that uh, transpires there is, uh, it remains an important issue for more members of Congress than um, perhaps Title V or CDC, we need to ensure that members understand that these three issues and, and what they entail as part of the broader public health service compendium um, are all extremely important, and we don't want to see one pitted um, against the, the other. And I'm sure by now you probably had some um, fact sheets or background information that has been presented on what will be your key issues for um, uh, next week. As we talked a moment ago, um, there are lots of ways of uh, communicating to the, the top two policymakers, and you'll be doing your business next week. Um, the social media is another um, emerging tool, and um, with trying to say this with a straight face in this time of um, misplaced Twitters, the or tweets, I guess it is, that just shows my age, um, the social media is really being used by a good percentage of members of Congress, whether it's Facebook, 
uh, using Twitter and other uh, mechanisms. And, you know, again, it's, it's, there are all sorts of cautionary um, issues around that. But nonetheless, joining in so that you're able to see what your members of Congress are doing and thinking about is very important. Um, your, your timing of communicating your message is a very important part of, uh, of thinking through your, your strategy. Um, when you're here next week, it will be shortly before the next uh, recess that uh, Congress will will have, and uh, lots of discussion on funding issues. So that will be important to bring up um, issues around the maternal and child health block grant um, in particular, and also um, within CDC, as noted, the protecting and supporting um, as the well-being of individuals across the lifespan from birth defects and disabilities and overall public health. Um, your in-person meeting with um, your uh, member of Congress and uh, whether it's through uh, your visits next week or in any public meeting, there will be lots of public meetings that will transpire in the month of uh, August when they're on their summer recess and I would encourage the follow-up that you must do after your visit next week can well be in um, in August while they're at home bringing forward the same um, passion and importance of the issues that you discuss um, that you will discuss next week. Um, for some of you this might be your first meeting, um, and since it is a non-election year, although that's hard to believe with debates and people announcing for presidency and then members leaving Congress, um, for those of you who this is an introductory meeting, your first meeting, here it's important to establish your um, credibility, that you are a resource, uh, that you have information that you can share, that you're willing to engage, um, get to know what's important to that member of Congress uh, who's making uh, decisions on issues that are important to you. As noted, you want to maintain this contact. Um, this should not be your first visit. This should be one of several that you will hopefully plan out or in other means of correspondence, whether that's through letters, through writing an op-ed in your, your hometown um, paper. And again, bringing the issue to life, uh, bringing a solution to life, telling the story is probably one of the most important things that you can do. Um, I always like to provide some sense of how your meeting might go. And I, I do this from uh, the perspective of, well, here are possible responses to that meeting you may have uh, next week um, or a discussion with a congressional uh, staff person. Um, the notion of, you know, thanks, I'm glad you were here, but you know, we'll call you if we need anything. You know, you cannot be deterred by that. Uh, and, and that's a, a, an easy cop-out. Uh, really try and without going over the top to present yourself in a manner that they will call you and they want to have that conversation. Um, probably one of the easier face-to-face um, -face meetings you will have is the staff person or the member of Congress, of which we now know there are 94 in the House and 13 in the Senate, who's new, and health and health-related issues in health care, uh, let alone um, talking about genetics, is not in their portfolio. They know nothing about it. Um, this is a um, 
easier opportunity because you do have the chance of laying out the importance of your um, particular issue that you're bringing up to the Hill, whether it's the um, translational research and uh, the new center that should be, will come about at, at NIH. It is a lot easier to explain its importance, putting it into context and perspective if that, if that staff person or member is, is new. Um, it's also pretty easy if the staff person completely agrees with you. Um, let's just say that doesn't happen very often, um, but when it, it does, that's a good thing. Um, again, there's an opportunity to establish an ongoing relationship and ensure that you can be and will be a resource. Um, the more difficult is the, yeah, I agree, but um, I don't think we should be putting any more money in the maternal and child health block grant. Um, we have a budget that needs to be cut. We're spending too much money. Those do present a little more um, thought. Uh, and in those instances, I encourage you to return to, you know, what are the facts, why it's important, what um, – uh, what value the, if we're using the MCH block grant as an example, um, what value, how uh, the uh, the whole genetic component of MCHB is really one of the more significant outside of the um, NIH um, arena, and they need to, to know that. Um, Hopefully, you won't have um, too many of the latter uh, of disagreement and disagreeable staff or uh, members of Congress. Um, but sometimes you do, and the, the only thing I can um, best suggest is to not engage in uh, the potential argument. Um, always having an Escape hatch at that point is um, a good thing, but engaging to the extent that you can make the point, and that's where knowing what your community is and knowing, say, that, um, for example, that birth defects are increasing in your community, these may be things that staff and members are just not aware of. So that goes back to why you have to know the community and be able to convey that, that story. But above all, trying to be polite, and sometimes I will admit that that is often very difficult, um, and not to join into um, what could potentially be um, a hostile environment. There are what um, I call my own cardinal rules for meeting with um, uh, policymakers. Um, this is an extraordinary opportunity to educate, um, to to lay out, to be very specific on um, your issue, um, whatever that may be. The value of incentivizing translational research that the National Center for Accelerating Trans translational sciences um, at NIH is going to be transformative. All of the key issues um, that you can articulate, um, that is important. And, you know, doing that with uh, the notion of obviously not being condescending, as one might consider when you're looking at a young staffer um, who has more of the deer in the headlights look, um, but keeping in mind that they have a very important role and you have an important role to educate. There are approximately 25,000 staff people um, on the Hill now on the House and the, on the Senate side, and um, the importance of cultivating that relationship with the staff is of equal importance and sometimes even more important than having the face time with the senator or the face time with the representative. Um, 
you want to be as supportive of the issues of interest to your uh, congressional leader as you can be. Uh, you want to establish a degree of trust and trustworthiness of the information that you have, materials that you can provide. One of the uh, most unfortunate uh, set of circumstances is providing information that is at all um, misleading and inaccurate. Um, you want to be able to take enough time in having these discussions, but you need to be very strategic and be very aware of what else is going on on that particular day in that particular office. Um, so to the extent that you are aware of what's going on at home, um, that's very important because there could be things that are preoccupying uh, that congressional um, office, especially if you go into the member's office who represents Joplin, Kansas. Um, talking about the NIH may be the last thing that that member may want to do as the cleanup continues. So again, knowing your community, knowing the district becomes um, very valuable, ensuring that you have some sense of what's going on at home, what are, is, uh, the, what are the priorities of this member, and be very strategic um, about that. Uh, it's very possible that there could be some bill of importance on the House or the Senate floor next week. So. Uh, there's a degree of preoccupation um, with that, and you may need to walk and talk as that staff person goes to the House or the Senate floor. Be flexible. Be able to do that. Above all, really try and uh, and listen. In addition to um, sort of one of the a, a key question to inquire as you're noting what's going on in the office. Um, who's been there before you. Always remember to sign the guest book when you're in your uh, Senate office or you're in your representative's office, the representative that represents you back at, at home. But um, as appropriate, try and get a sense of um, how and what is um, as noted before, uh, how's the mail running on um, a particular issue? Um, are they hearing about funding for NIH? Are they hearing about, um, you know, CDC and Title V? Um, congressional staff must respond to um, uh, letters and communications from constituents. Um, mail is usually uh, some uh, recognition of uh, support or, or opposition. Probably right now, a lot of mail is transpiring related to um, health care reform and Medicare in particular. How do you um, make that a um, issue of importance to the, the Genetic Alliance to get a sense of what they're hearing? Um, oftentimes, um, what is written in a letter, you will hear. Or, or in an email or some other communication, a visit from a constituent, you will hear that personal story on the Hill. I've now been um, at this long enough to remember when that first began back in uh, the 1980s and with the uh, beginning of televised um, House and Senate floor activity, um, personal stories become very, very um, important, and uh, in, in also sort of judging what they're hearing, um, be able to and be willing to be very responsive after a particular vote um, related to the appropriations issues that are an underpinning of some of your um, legislative issues that are, are outlined here, um, the appropriations process and where that will be for issues of importance to the Genetic Alliance 
It's not going to be until August, just before they come home for their summer um, recess. But you also now then have to be ready to uh, convey your happiness or unhappiness with their vote on that particular issue. Uh, and as well as where's the negative mail, it's where's the positive mail. So some of that, you know, you may well need to to generate as well. Um, I'd like to now um, open it up to um, questions that you might have. Um, there are tons of directions I, I could have gone in um, as, as as simple as, you know, where you're holding, where the meeting is going to be held. If you're, you know, as I said before, if you're walking with uh, a congressional staff person as they're going to the floor, they may say, let's have a meeting in the Rayburn cafeteria or the Longworth cafeteria on the house side. Or um, at, And there's lots of activity going on. You may be having a meeting in a small little space that they – call their um, office in the representative of the senator's um, office, and again, with a lot of stuff going on. Um, so being cognizant of how fast you need to talk, if the, the, the one-minute elevated speech is um, critical, that you're um, able to convey your key points um, in a succinct way, in a very personal way, um, and offer again, to be their resource. Questions? I have a question to kick it off. It's Molly from Genetic Alliance. Um, and just for those that join late, they can always, you can always type in your questions in the sidebar and we'll read them. Um, so you mentioned that, Karen, building relationships is really important to, you know, um, making an impact basically on the health. But for a lot of people coming to the Hill every day, they're from, you know, their congressional districts, and um, uh, that varies across the country. So what are the best ways, I guess, if you do make a connection with the Congress member or the specific senator or staffer or what have you, how, what are the best ways to keep that relationship going when they return home? Um, good question. Uh, I think there are a variety of ways. The first thing is after the visit, um, when you um, get home, uh, well, first, very first thing is to ask that staff person, what is the best way for me to stay in touch with you? And I say that because of the amount of emails that uh, congressional offices get. Um, so if it's email communication, you want to make sure they recognize your um, email, they recognize that you're a constituent, because um, there are all sorts of filters that staff offices have to filter in and filter out. And so do they prefer emails? Do they prefer a fax? God knows I haven't seen a fax in so long. But do they prefer a fax? Uh, or is picking up the phone um, the best way? So sort of clarifying that. And then I think as um, it's time goes on, uh, the new information, new publication, um, opportunities to be in the district and see, um, you know, the work that you are engaged in, you are involved with, um, see that in action, inviting um, congressional staff to your uh you know, a, a community activity related to uh, why you're you're being in touch with that that member. All of those are um, important ongoing communications. If you have an op-ed that's run, uh, sending that uh, members of Congress look at their hometown newspaper every day. They look at the Washington Post, the New York Times. Um, in in some order every day. So if you have, um, you know, published that, if there is a specific uh, conference or a briefing that is of importance, 
uh, letting that staff person um, know. Um, all of those are important. Also, um, there, there's what you do here, and it's what you do with the uh, Congressional Senate offices at home. Most of the offices at home are really around constituent relationships of less policy focus, um, but also valuable in building that relationship. Um, look and see if there are uh, health-related uh, advisory, research-related advisory committees or uh, something along that line that congressional offices um, uh, members may have. Join their email list. Uh, a lot of members have uh, email lists. Uh, a listserv, be part of that um, as well so that it's a two-way street. Okay, I, we have another question that is, um, if you, so a lo, some of the congressional districts that people are coming from don't have a congressperson that is on any of the health committees. Um, so educating them on these health-related issues, is it really impactful? How do they then use that information, I guess, in their everyday life? Right. Um, remember that every single member of the House and Senate must vote on a, on a bill. Um, so it doesn't matter that they're, they're not on um, that committee. You want to ensure that they are making um, an informed vote, and so educating uh, that particular person um, who is on the Foreign Relations Committee is just as important as that member who is on one of the um, health or health-related committees. And I can't stress that um, enough. And that's why having a, you know, short, pithy one-page with all the facts that, you know, or fit to print on there, uh, that information so you can leave something behind. So when it's time for the vote, oftentimes staff are preparing a memorandum and uh, providing other information to their member as they prepare to take that vote. So you want to be able to educate that non-health committee person. Um, this is where it's also important to take a little bit of time, um, and it's so easy to do uh, now in the 21st century than it has been in, in, in the past, and uh, know what that member of Congress's bio is. Are there issues that, um, while she or he is not on the requisite committee, they may have great interest in? Um, the member of Congress whose child was born a couple of years ago with uh, Down syndrome has uh, a lot of issues that now, while she's not on the health-related commi uh, committees, disabilities is now an important issue for her. Uh, you know, research that's going on at NIH is an important issue for her. So. Getting a snapshot in your head of knowing that member, um, knowing a little bit about them to the extent that you're not a stalker is important um, so that you can convey uh, information and ensure that every single office has the information they need to make an informed decision. Now, whether they'll vote the right way, hmm. Sometimes not so good. Uh, and then that's the follow-up. Again, going back to building that relationship of being able to express your disappointment in that. But let's continue to talk. Great. So we have time for about one more question. Um, someone asked, if we are new to our local politics, what is the best way to understand and educate ourselves on the background information that is important to the members we are visiting? Um, the easiest um, way to go about um, doing that is to go directly to 
uh, I was trying to look it up while I was doing it, and I realized my computer's down. Um, it, it should be House.gov and Senate.gov. The profiles of each of the members are on online. And looking at that, looking at the website, getting a sense of what committees, uh, what uh, caucuses that they may belong to, um, and, and without making a political statement or judgment, there are a solid handful, two, three, four handfuls of uh, new members who are part of the, the Tea Party caucus that now, presidential candidate Michelle Bachman from Minnesota is is chair. So there are certain things that you know about that. I mean, that's information that is important. Um, there are members who are a part of the biomedical caucus, and that will be on um, their their websites um, as well. So at least you know if they're part of the biomedical caucus, maybe they care about NIH and research. That's a good thing. Uh, so that's another way of, of, of looking at um, having some sense of the background on that particular member. And it is very much worth the time to do that. It, I cannot stress that um, enough. You will often be surprised what you what kind of relationship you may have. Your family members, your daughter, your son could be in school with uh, a member of Congress. Um, all of those you may know that, you know, they are, um, you know, every year that particular uh, member has uh, a, a big barbecue, do as much research as you can in short order. This is not a um, this is not a thesis. This is not your dissertation. It is an opportunity to uh, be able to be as informed because rest assured, they're gonna Google you, and um, it is worth the time that you spend. Uh, knowing a little bit about that member, and it, it, it's relative. It is it's not relatively easy. It is very easy. Um, and if you get a little extra free time and you're really bored, especially in the middle of the night, um, do turn on C-SPAN. Um, it's always chock full with experience um, there. So I'm just going to do one more question because I think it's a good one, and that is someone asked, should you only be a one-issue constituent? Uh, I, um, this is a personal opinion and personal experience. If that one issue is a broad issue, so if Research. There's so many biomedical uh, and um, uh, behavioral research, for example. It's so broad. Um, the issues we work on here is public health. It is so broad. That's one way of looking at it. So under that, there is a whole litany of issues you can work on. Um, it does get a little. Um, uh, it's sometimes a little difficult if, if the the one issue that is um, the thorn in everyone's side, whatever that particular issue um, might be, uh, some of the the more delicate issues, um, whether it's uh, you know abortion, that that that's tough. That is a really, really um, tough road um, to to go down, and I, I've often said to my uh, colleagues in the re reproductive rights community, it's really helpful if that is put contextually into health and what um, 
reproductive health issues mean, what family planning issues and public health and how those are, are important rather than that one word, which usually there's not great love around that uh, on the Hill. Um, there are the positives of, sort of that single focus if you are able to constantly provide the most accurate, the important, say it in English, uh, language information about that issue. I mean, for, with the Genetic Discrimination Act, um, the activities that went on, uh, on the Hill that was led by, in, in large part, the, the work of the Genetic um, Alliance um, collaboratively, um, that's where a group of folks working on one issue made um, a great deal of difference because there you were working collaboratively in coalition and you could see sort of the broad array of, of issues. So that's a little different. Uh, it's the one issue but represented, but represented by multiple people. Now, if you're going to the Hill, um, in that instance of one issue, because I'm thinking that perhaps that's where that question was coming from, um, I'm a believer of going up to the Hill to talk about one thing and um, one thing only. It gets a little distracting, and you may not have enough time to talk about the three things on on your list, but that comes from uh, my experiences and my experiences with uh, working with physicians. And one issue was always a better way um, to go because they can hone in on that, have their three key points about that issue, give um, one or two specific examples or stories about that, and um, proceed on. Great. That is great advice. Thank you so much, Karen. As always, your presentation was very informative. Um, we are running into 1 o'clock, so I want to wrap up by um, just pointing out the coming webinars. Um, our next webinar is June 29th, and it's about the value of family history in prenatal care setting. Um, so definitely some interest to go and sign up. Um, also, I we did get a lot of questions about when Genetics Day on the Hill, when the Congress people list, when we have like, your schedules to you and talking points, and I want to assure everyone that we are working on those, and um, they should be in your um, hands by either the end of this week or the beginning of next week. So, again, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful Wednesday.